In part two, we'll review the anatomy of the brachial plexus and look at the more common brachial plexopathies. The next several slides will recap the anatomy of the brachial plexus. I'd like to make sure you understand the brachial plexus before we go into the various plexopathies. Take your time. There are several excellent examples on the internet of how to learn this spider web of nerves. Hopefully by the time we've done this review, you'll have, again, a better understanding of the brachial plexus. Please use Dr. Acklin's videos to help you orient yourself to this tangle of important nerves in the axillary area. The link above will show you how to find Dr. Acklin's video library. They're stunning examples, and you should use them for all your cadaveric anatomy studies in addition to the wet lab. Here's a first image of the spider webs of the brachial plexus. Let's take a look at it nerve by nerve and try to make some sense of it again out of this tangle. In 20 years in surgery, not once did I ever see this structure loose and hanging free. If I had, I guarantee it would have been a bad day for me and the patient. Thankfully, injuries to the brachial plexus are relatively rare, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. I think it's easier to learn the brachial plexus from what you already know about the innervation of the upper extremity. This will make more sense in a bit, but let's approach the plexus from proximal to distal. First, remember the brachial plexus is derived from spinal nerves C5 to T1. The phrenic nerve C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive is also noted here. The plexus proper is found between the anterior scalene and middle scalene muscles. Remember how the anterior scalene distally lies between the subclavian artery and the vein. The upper trunk and middle trunks, remember, lie under herb's point. Go back and look at part one of this presentation to identify herb's point. The upper trunk is made up of the joining of C5 and C6. The middle trunk is derived from C7, and the lower trunk is derived from C8 and T1. Remember, there are seven cervical vertebra but eight cervical spinal nerves. The cords are named in relationship to the axillary artery. The posterior cord is posterior to the artery. The lateral cord is lateral to the artery, and the medial cord, of course, is medial to the artery. Now let's introduce what we know about the arm's innervation distally. In anatomical position, the palmar surface of the hand is innervated medially by the ulnar nerve laterally by the median nerve and posteriorly the hand is innervated by the ulnar nerve and the radial nerve. With this knowledge we can deduce from what portion of the brachial plexus these branches arise from. Here's what I mean. The median nerve which innervates the lateral aspect of the hand is derived from the lateral cord and the medial cord it makes sense the median nerve innervates the lateral aspect of the hands hence derived from the medial cord, i.e. median nerve, hence its name. But where it actually innervates is the lateral aspect of the hand, i.e. lateral cord divisions. Then if we look at the posterior hand, it's innervated by the ulnar, i.e. the medial aspect, and the radial nerve laterally. The ulnar nerve is derived from branches of the medial cord. The myocutaneous nerve, which is motor above the elbow and sensory below the elbow, is derived from the lateral cord because, as we've seen, the musculocutaneous nerve lies laterally on the upper arm, piercing the coracobrachialis muscle and giving branches to the, to the biceps brachii and brachialis as it moves laterally. Lots of lateral movement here. I hope this is starting to make sense. I repeat myself over and over in the next few slides, so let's take a better look. Remember the phrenic nerve, which innervates the diaphragm, comes from C3, C4, and C5. The phrenic nerve is motor and sensory to the diaphragm. There's a trick question that always comes about when we talk about the phrenic nerve. We always ask the medical student, is the phrenic nerve sympathetic or parasympathetic? If you remember that parasympathetic fibers usually come from cranial sacral division of the spinal cord and the sympathetic comes from the thoracolumbar, you realize that we haven't mentioned anything about the cervical nerves. 
because they're not part of the sympathetic nervous system. So let's look at this image for just a second. Here the long thoracic nerve comes from C5, C6, and C7. The long thoracic nerve is important because it innervates the serratus anterior. Accidentally in injuring this nerve during a mastectomy performed for breast cancer can cause winging of the scapula. There are photos of this in your anatomy textbook. In this image, we see the anatomical boundaries of a mastectomy, the pectoralis major medially, the axillary vein seen superiorly as a blue structure here, the serratus anterior medially on the chest wall, and the latissimus dorsi most laterally. Minor injuries from a blow to the ribs underneath an outstretched arm like a football player stiff arming can cause what's called a stinger burner injury. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Here's some more wordplay. Notice the thoracal dorsal lower subscapular and upper subscapular nerves come from the posterior cord. I've emphasized these words because dorsal and sub are referring to inferior and posterior in origin. That's another way to remember which cords these nerves come from. The thoracodorsal nerve innervates the latissimus dorsi and the upper and lower subscapular nerve innervates the subscapularis. The lower subscapular nerve also sends a branch to the teres minor. The thoracodorsal nerve is also known as the middle subscapular nerve. Wow, there's a lot of information here. Don't be overloaded just by staring at this. You've seen it before. Remember, this is a review. It essentially is telling us what we've already discussed. Let's summarize. The axillary nerve is made of fibers from C5, C6. We know that because it's a branch of the lateral aspect of the posterior cord. The musculocutaneous nerve, sensory below the elbow and motor above the elbow, where it courses laterally to the cutaneous skin, come from the lateral cord fibers from C5, C6, and C7. The median nerve, providing innervation to the lateral aspect of the hand on the palmar aspect, gets contributions from the lateral cord and the medial cord, C6, C7, C8, and T1. The radial nerve, providing innervation to the posterior lateral aspect of the hand comes from the posterior cord, branches of C5, C6, C7, and C8. C5 and C6 make up the upper trunk, C7 gives us the medial trunk, and C8, T1 make up the lower trunk. Lots of contributions to the radial nerve. The ulnar nerve, which innervates the fourth and fifth fingers, both anteriorly and posteriorly, comes from the median cord, C7, C8, and T1. So where does this information come in handy? Well, we begin to study the dermatomes and the myotomes for the cutaneous innervations and muscular innervations. It'll make sense. Whether a nerve is on the anterior surface, i.e. the flexor surface, or the posterior surface, the extensor surface, gives us some idea of what the function of the, what the respective nerve is. Okay, now let's look at the bigger picture as the peripheral nerves are named in the relationship to the axillary artery. Here the radial nerve, which again supplies the posterior lateral aspect of the hand, comes off the posterior cord. Of course, the ulnar nerve, which supplies the medial anterior and posterior aspect of the hand, comes from the medial cord, and the median nerve is derived from the lateral and medial cords. It all sort of makes sense if you work from what you know, i.e. just like reading a rat radiograph, it's working from what you know to what you don't know. Where does the musculocutaneous nerve supply sensory innervation below the elbow? The lateral aspect of the forearm? So you'd expect the axillary nerve to come from the lateral cord, and that's what we see. So before we go into the details of the plexus, first a mnemonic to help you to learn the major separations of the brachial plexus from proximal to distal. The roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. From those of you who do not know who he is, Randy Travis is a country music star. 
Uh, unfortunately, this photo was taken on a night when he wasn't so popular. The mnemonic is Randy Travis drinks cold beer. If you remember that mnemonic, it'll help you to remember the major separations of the brachial plexus from proximal to distal. So we have already defined the roots as being the anterior rami of the spinal nerves. The brachial plexus is formed when C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 all come together. These will become important when we talk about Herb's palsy and Klumpke's palsy a bit later. And remember, where the roots are located in the neck, in order for an injury to occur at this level, it would take a significant stretch injury or trauma. These roots are not easily accessible. The trunks are fairly well isolated. It's where C5 and C6 join, i.e. the upper trunk, C7 forms the middle trunk, and finally, C8, T1 join to form the lower trunk. Now the trunks begin to divide into the posterior cord, and the distal branches are beginning to take shape and innervate the arm and the forearm. So why do we care? Well, in truth, a brachial plexus injury, a transection or a stretch can be a very serious and most of the time surgical correction, like many nerve injuries, does not allow full return to function. In fact, partial return to function is at best all we can hope for. But what do you do if your task was to reapproximate these nerves? What would your anatomical reference be to identify the respective divisions? Now we're down to the cords, and they're named in relationship to the axillary artery. Lateral, medial, and posterior cords. It is a posterior dislocation of the shoulder that affects the axillary nerve, and that makes sense because the axillary nerve arises from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. The musculocutaneous nerve supplies the lateral aspect of the forearm, and it arises from the lateral cord. Remember, the musculocutaneous nerve is motor above the elbow and sensory lateral aspect below the elbow. The musculocutaneous nerve penetrates the coracobrachialis muscle on its way to the biceps brachii and the brachialis. This photo is self-explanatory. The cords of the brachial plexus are named for their relationship to the axillary artery. Lots of information here. Two nerves are in danger when a mastectomy is performed for breast cancer. The long thoracic nerve, which innervates the serratus muscles, and the thoracodorsal nerve, which innervates the latissimus dorsi, the lateral dorsal muscle. The anatomical boundaries of a mastectomy are the clavicle, the axillary vein, the latissimus dorsi muscle, and the serratus anterior. Let's take a look at where these branches come from, from these two important nerves. You know the distal branches already and what they innervate. Most of this you've put together already from what you know about the branches. Let's just magnify it. Remember, understanding the brachial plexus can often be done from what you know to what you don't know. And the first thing that you know are these distal branches of the hand and what they innervate. Let's start there and work backwards. So learning the relationship to the axillary artery helps you learn the plexus. In reality, it's unlikely you'll ever see this on a patient. If you do, it's a bad day for them and for you. But we have to drive this relationship home because if you understand the relationship of the cords and their position to the axillary artery, you'll be able to better understand the brachial plexus and its innervations distal down towards the hand. So here's one of the best ways that I know, at least to draw and learn the brachial plexus. Open your PowerPoint so it's not in presenter mode. Double click on this and download. Given that this is a review so far of the brachial plexus, I've placed two links to help you learn the brachial plexus. Please click on them and listen to the links. Hopefully these teaching aids will help you understand, draw, and recognize the clinical symptoms attributed to damages and or diseases of the brachial plexus. This image is highly schematic of the brachial plexus anatomy, but you get an idea from looking at it where those important distal nerves are
and where and how they innervate structures and muscles of the upper arm and of the forearm. The purpose of putting this chart into this presentation is to allow you to look at actually how much you've already synthesized and what you do know. I suggest that you work from the left side of the chart over towards the right side of the chart. If you look at the left side of the chart and recognize the nerves that come from the posterior, medial, and lateral cords, you'll be able to understand the level from the brachial plexus that they arise from and their motor or sensory innervations to the associated muscles. All anatomists like to use the letter M to point out the distal branches of the brachial plexus. Let's take a look at those branches. The median nerve, which lies on the median surface of the axillary artery, is formed from lateral and medial roots of the lateral cord and medial cord respectively. The medial cord forms our ulnar nerve, which we know the ulnar nerve innervates the median aspect of our hand. The most lateral aspect of the cord gives rise to the sensory innervation from the musculocutaneous nerve to the forearm. And we also know that the radial nerve innervates the posterior aspect of the hand, and it, of course, is coming off the posterior cord, as is the axillary nerve, the nerve most commonly injured in a posterior dislocation of the shoulder. <clears throat> if you understand the brachial plexus, you're able to draw it, and you are able to trace it either distally, proximally, or from proximal to distal, you'll better understand some of this cutaneous innervation of the forearm and the arm proper. So I've provided three separate links here that make use of an anesthesiologist's knowledge of the innervation of the upper extremity in the operating room. The anesthesiologist may have to place blocks of these various nerves. The first link shows anatomy of the brachial plexus via ultrasonography. The second shows a supraclavicular nerve block, and the last link shows an ultrasound-guided axillary nerve block. Notice each of the anatomical landmarks the anesthesiologist uses. The jugular fossa, the clavicle, the acromion, the infraclavicular fossa. In part one of this presentation, we spoke about the relationship of the brachial plexus to the anterior scalene muscle. I even mentioned a syndrome called the anterior scalene syndrome treated by resection of the anterior scalene muscle. You can see how the brachial plexus lies between the anterior and the middle scalenes, and in theory, hypertrophy of these muscles could cause compression of the nerve roots. I think that would be exceedingly rare, however. Make sure that you are not in slideshow mode on your version of PowerPoint. If you are, you won't be able to download this informative file from up to date. Here is the information on the brachial plexus syndromes. Plexopathies of the brachial plexus, or of any plexus for that matter, can result in motor, sensory, and sympathetic disturbances. They can also present as a diverse paralysis, a paresthesia, an area of anesthesia, and there are many causes Specifically, those etiologies of plexopathies to the brachial plexus include the stinger burner injury, which I pointed out earlier, often a result of active football, wrestling, cycling, or even martial arts. Sometimes there's even a plexitis, a low-grade inflammation of the brachial plexus called Parsonage-Turner syndrome, which I've never seen. Obstetrical injury is one of the most common causes of a brachial plexopathy, and we'll look at those more closely because they're more common. Of course, motor vehicle trauma, stabbings or sharp trauma, as well as radiation damage, and sometimes even cancers and tumors in the apex of the lung area can cause plexopathies to the brachial plexus. Let's take a look at some of the common brachial plexus pathologies and how they're caused. For example, compression, a result of contact sports, weightlifting, or football, can cause an injury to the brachial plexus. Transection, such as sharp trauma or even high force traction, pulling an arm off. While that's rare, it can be seen. Ischemia, as a result of an injury to the vas nervorum, of the nerve can cause ischemic damage to any nerve and let alone any of the nerves in the brachial plexus. 
of course, an inflammatory response from local inflammation. Even metabolic abnormalities such as diabetes can cause plexopathies. Diabetes is famous for causing a peripheral neuropathy, but in more rare cases, it can cause a plexopathy. We'll see this later as part of the lumbosacral plexopathies. Cancer, specifically br breast cancer and lung cancer, are also responsible for causing erosions into the brachial plexus. And radiation therapy used to treat lung and breast cancer can result in an inflammatory response, which will also cause a brachial plexus injury. Then there are other non-traumatic palsies, such as a neuralgic amyotrophy, hereditary brachial plexopathy, and thoracic outlet syndrome. Of all of these, I've heard and seen only thoracic outlet syndrome. I've also placed a Adobe PDF document on this slide for you to download and read at your leisure regarding the causes of brachial plexus pathologies. Let's take a look at four heavily promoted syndromes causing plexopathies of the brachial plexus. I've already mentioned scalene anticus syndrome. It, there is also cervical rib syndrome, and this reference uses both of them collectively together, although I think their causes are different. The scalene syndrome is a result of a hypertrophied anterior scalene muscle. Here they say there's neurovascular compression in the inner scalene space caused by a cervical rib or a ligamentous structure. So anterior scalene syndrome is different than having a congenital cervical rib, which leads us to the costoclavicular syndrome, a result of narrowing of the space between the first rib and the clavicle. Notice this difference here. This is a normal anatomical narrowing of the space between the first rib and clavicle, whereas a cervical rib is not a first rib. It's a rib that arises from one of the cervical vertebra, not the thoracic vertebra. Then there's hyperabduction syndrome, which is compression of the brachial plexus by the pectoralis minor muscle, not the pectoralis major muscle, but by the pectoralis minor muscle, and the coracoid process when the upper arm is raised up over the head. And then of course, there's something that all of the students are familiar with, and that's called backpack paralysis. A chronic heavy load on the shoulder girdle can result in numbness and tingling distally and cause a compression of the brachial plexus and its divisions and branches. So as we discuss these obstetrical brachial plexus injuries, you have to put yourself back in the time period when a lot of these were first discovered and described. The babies were born without anesthesia to the mother or to the baby. There was no epidural or spinal anesthetics given. And sometimes they had to do the best they could to pull the baby out. And that usually means pulling on the little guy or little girl's arms, sometimes both arms. That can result in something called a bilateral arm paralysis in the newborn described in 1768. And then there's a common one, Duchenne obstetrical paralysis, described in 1872 of a term infant. And then Herb comes along in 74 and describes paralysis at the C5, C6 level. You can figure out what's going to be inhibited in its movement and sensation if we paralyze C5 and C6. Of course, Klumke's paralysis is paralysis of the entire lower plexus, described in 1885. Finally, in 1980, Gilbert tried to do a surgical reconstruction using microsurgery to reapproximate torn fibers of the brachial plexus. Needless to say that while this surgery is done today, the success rate ranges from 50 to 75 or 80 percent which is pretty good, but rarely do any of these patients regain full use and or sensation of the extremity that's been injured. So just how common are these neonatal brachial plexus palsies? A rate described is between 0.04 to 0.3 of live births. It still isn't very common. Some of the risk factors include a large maternal weight gain, maternal diabetes, which as you know can cause a large infant, many births, multi-parity at the same time, twins, triplets, etc. 
fetal macrosomia and a high birth weight, which goes along with the maternal diabetes, and of course, breech position. Many cases are not due to a shoulder dystocia or excessive force by the provider. In fact, it may be associated with a shoulder dystocia and or a prenatal insult. There have been many commercials on television describing lawyers in class action suits asking for clients who may have suffered a brachial plexus injury at birth. Of course, they need to do their due diligence because we now know that there are other causes for brachial plexus injuries besides excessive force by the obstetrician. So let's take a look at the first two palsies described, Herb Duchenne palsy, otherwise known as Herb's palsy. This is a result, usually of a birth injury, when delivering the baby's head through the birth canal and the shoulder gets stuck underneath the pubic symphysis. This trapped shoulder results in pulling and tugging on the baby's head, stretching the brachial plexus, and eventually resulting in a plexus and injury to C5, C6, causing a waiter's tip deformity, where the arm is at the right side and the hand is somewhat flexed uh, as if the waiter is waiting for his tip. This is a result of a C5, C6 injury and can be permanent. We've seen Herb's palsy. Now let's talk about Herb's palsy plus. In fact, I just described it. Herb's palsy is a paralysis of C5 and C6. About 50% of the cases of a brachial plexus palsy are a result of this C5 and C6 injury. This causes a weak deltoid and a weak infraspinatus muscle, which as you can imagine results in difficulty in elevating the arm up and over the head. Hand and wrist movement is preserved. So the baby in the previous slide does not have an Herb's palsy. That baby has Herb's palsy plus, a result of C5, C6, and C7 injury resulting in the waiter's tip. Not as common as the simple Herb's palsy of C5 and 6, but it still accounts for about 35% of cases. If there's injury from C5 to T1, that's the entire brachial plexus. There can be arm paralysis and maybe some sparing of finger flexion. In severe damage, they can have a flail arm or a Horner syndrome can occur. Horner syndrome is a result of ptosis, meiosis, and andhydrosis. Please see the slide comments to describe that more. Interestingly, in a Horner syndrome, partial ptosis of the upper eyelid, i.e. loss of sympathetic innervation of the superior tarsal muscle, anhydrosis, which is decreased sweating on the affected side of the face, and small pupils, i.e. meiosis, can be seen with this total paralysis of C5 to T1 of the entire brachial plexus. Thank God these are rare injuries. So we know from the previous slides that the Herb's palsy affects C5 and C6, but the Herb's palsy plus results in the waiter's tip abnormality. If it's purely C5 and C6, we won't necessarily see the waiter's tip. But we do know that in a pure Herb's palsy, that the suprascapular nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the axillary nerve can all contribute to this waiter's tip deformity. And just for fun, I put a link to Martin Sheen here. He was born with Herb's palsy, and there's a clip on YouTube showing him putting on his jacket because it's the only way he knows how because he was born with this devastating injury, an Herb's palsy, not the Herb's palsy plus. So let's review again. Herb's palsy is caused from an injury to C5 and C6. Herb's palsy plus with the waiter's tip deformity has to somehow involve those branches from C7 contributing to both the axillary and the musculocutaneous nerves as seen here. Here again, we can see how the Herb's palsy is formed. The infant's head is pulled from the birth canal with the resulting shoulder dystocia, the shoulder being clipped underneath the pubic bone, causing stretch on the brachial plexus. On the right, we see a slide where we have surgical exposure for the repair of a brachial plexus injury. We see a neuroma has formed. Also, we see the stretch injury at C8. Here, the surgeon has removed the 
the damaged areas of the brachial plexus, and then taken a piece of sural nerve from the back of the lower leg and performed a nerve graft to those areas of the brachial plexus which are damaged. Unfortunately, success from this operation is not very good. The last image on the left lower aspect shows multiple injuries to the brachial plexus which can occur. We're aware of the herbs palsy with the shoulder rotated inward and the waiter's hip deformity with the associated atrophy of the muscles in the affected arm. We're also aware of winging of the scapula as a result to damage of the long thoracic nerve. We also can have a Horner syndrome, which is, as I mentioned earlier, ptosis and hydrosis and meiosis. Now let's take a second to talk about Klumpke's paralysis. Klumpke's paralysis results from injuries to C8 and T1, the lower brachial plexus. The paralysis affects mostly the intrinsic muscles of the hand, the interossei, the thenars, and the hypothenar muscles. Flexors of the wrist and fingers can also be affected, the flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar half of the flexor digitorum profundus. Horner's syndrome can also be seen with a Klumpke's paralysis. The mnemonic, Klumpke the monkey hung from a tree, can help you remember how this injury occurs. The image on the upper right shows a good example of how the injury can occur in an adult and also how it can occur in a newborn with stretching and pulling of the arm trying to deliver the infant. In a severe Klumpke's paralysis affecting the lumbricals of the hand, we could see a severe claw hand deformity. The C8-T1 injury affecting the lumbricals of the hand muscles can result in a claw hand, like this image shows us. This is indeed a severe injury and, as we mentioned earlier, is a result of damage to those muscles of the hand and also from the inner osseae muscles. So this is a simplistic diagram, but it basically reviews an herbs versus a Klumpke's paralysis. Herbs evolve C5, C6. Klumpke's is C8 to T1. Both of these can be caused from obstetrical injuries or injuries outside of the birth canal. The associated muscles that are affected, as well as the nerves distally of the brachial plexus, is something that you should try to commit to memory. Sports-induced plexopathies are also seen in adults. These are often a result of professional football injuries, as shown here. In figure one above, we see the congenital anomaly which can occur as a result of compression of the brachial plexus between the clavicle and the first rib. Thankfully, most of these cervical burner injuries result in only a temporary paralysis or a temporary burning or tingling sensation that can last for as little as a few minutes up to several weeks or even months. Here's an example of a compression plexopathy as a result of abduction. Here, a weightlifter is experiencing compression on his brachial plexus by the scalenus anticus syndrome. Here we see the brachial plexus coming between the heads of this anterior and middle scalene muscles and subsequently where they cross under the first rib but below the clavicle and then the upward abduction and extension of the weightlifter's arms results in compression of the brachial plexus. This too is often a temporary injury. Of course, we have to mention the traumatic brachial injury. Here are three photos from an individual who sustained either shotgun or gunshot wounds to the posterior aspect of his shoulder resulting in brachial plexus injuries. There's a link above to a video showing a brachial plexus reconstruction using the da Vinci robot. Again, these repairs are rarely 100% successful. The physician may actually even run into these injuries neoplastic-induced brachial plexopathies, of which breast cancer and lung cancer are the most common causes. These patients present with pain in the shoulder and axilla. The lower plexus is affected much more than the upper plexus, as it usually is a result of direct extension of tumor or compression by significant lymphatic obstruction. More often, these can be associated with Horner syndrome, as we've mentioned before, with ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis.
By now, you should make the relationship that Horner's syndrome is more often seen with damage to the brachial plexus if it affects the, the lower cords, i.e. C8 and T1. Primary tumors of nerves can indeed also cause a brachial plexopathy, such as a neurofroma or a schwannoma. Here's an image of lung cancer eroding into the apical aspect of the left lung, causing compression on the brachial plexus. This is what's called a pancose tumor. Treatment of a pancose tumor, considered unresectable, would consist of radiation and chemotherapy. Radiation can also worsen the plexopathy in the long run as it causes decreased blood flow to that area and causes ischemia to the nerves. Here's an example of a malignancy extending outside the thoracic cavity, probably breast cancer. In this case, a large tumor mass is seen compressing on the brachial plexus. This, of course, is unresectable and will result in a permanent injury to the brachial plexus. Here's a plexopathy probably familiar to every medical student, that of the rucksac or the backpack palsy. If you'd like, you can double click on the image and read the paper describing this plexopathy in more detail. The image on the lower right obviously shows an individual who has suffered a palsy and now has a winged scapula as a result of damage to his long thoracic nerve. Looking at these images, you'll probably reevaluate how heavy your backpack is. Neuralgic amyotrophy is unusual. It's probably best called by acute brachial radiculitis. Other names are shown here, none of which I've actually heard of. The image on the right shows a patient with a winged scapula, a result of damage to the long thoracic nerve. Interestingly, this disease, the acute brachial radiculitis, is usually multifocal and not global, meaning that it affects multiple points within the brachial plexus, but not the entire brachial plexus. Motor loss is usually greater than sensory loss. Autoimmune causes have also been implicated. There are some predisposing conditions, such as infection, too much exercise, surgery to the area, pregnancy, and or vaccinations, usually involving winging of the scapula. And of course, you can have bilateral winged scapula. This would be a tip-off that you most likely have a neuralgic amyotrophy and or an acute brachial radiculitis. Bilateral winged scapula would indeed be very unusual. I just wanted to bring back the diagram of the brachial plexus and show you which injury it is that results to the winged scapula. It's the long thoracic nerve. And if you remember, the long thoracic nerve gives, the long thoracic nerve is derived from branches of C5, C6, and C7. So here comes some real anatomical minutia. Hereditary neuralgic amyotrophy. It's a rare autosomal dominant disease. I've never seen this. It's apparently characterized by recurrent brachial plexopathies. It's associated on the septin 9 gene, results in short stature, hypotellurism, i.e. abnormally close eyes, a small face, unusual skin folds and creases on the neck, pain, paresthesia, followed by paresis of the shoulder and arm, and any part of the brachial plexus can be evolved, but usually the upper plexus. You can have long thoracic nerve involvement, as we know, causing a wing scapula, facial weakness and autonomic nervous system dysfunction can occur. And of course, flushing can occur as a result of injury involving the sympathetics. So we've already mentioned this in other slides, radiation induced brachial plexopathy, often seen as a secondary effect from those patients who've been treated with radiation because they have underlying lung and or breast cancer as if the lung cancer and or the breast cancer alone can't cause the plexopathy, the radiation can. There's less pain than the neoplastic plexopathy, and the pain occurs later in the course of the symptoms. Usually, however, there are more paresthesias and weakness than the neoplastic plexopathy. The diagnosis is supported by fasciculations on electrodiagnostic testing. This is called the myokymic discharge and it's only suggestive but not diagnostic of the radiation-induced brachial plexopathy.
this is a entity which you may run across in your clinical careers. I've seen probably half a dozen cases of patients who had been diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome. It's usually neurogenic or vascular in etiology. In the true neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, it's very rare, one in a million. Again, motor involvement is greater than sensory involvement, and it can be caused by a congenital fibrous band from the first rib to the tip of an elongated C7 transverse process or to a rudimentary cervical rib. They have features of a lower trunk plexopathy. The diagnosis is highly characteristic on nerve conduction velocities. There's a reduced or absent ulnar and medial antibrachial cutaneous sensory response, but a normal median sensory response. The, the reduced or absent ulnar and median response is almost pathognomonic for this. Remember, the median nerve is more affected than the ulnar nerve. In a true vascular thoracic outlet syndrome, the patient will have an abnormal arteriogram or venogram, but normal electrodiagnostic test. In this type of thoracic outlet syndrome, there is true compression of the subclavian vein and or subclavian artery between the first rib and the clavicle or as a result of a cervical rib. We've shown this earlier. This is a true compressive brachial plexopathy, either the result of a cervical rib causing compression on a first rib with the resultant tendinous insertion of the scalene anticus muscle or a hypertrophied scalene anticus can cause compressive neuropathy on the brachial plexus. If its vascular supply is involved, such as compression of the subclavian artery or vein, remember the anterior scalene lies between the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein, then vascular congestion can be seen with associated signs and symptoms of vascular, conjection, vascular congestion. We've seen this and mentioned this in earlier slides too, but here's that ligamentous attachment to the first rib. This is where the cervical rib is attached to a first rib by an abnormal ligament. This attachment can cause compression on the brachial plexus. Combined with hypertrophy of an anterior scalene, this could, of course, result in a real plexopathy. Note that the cervical rib is a congenital anomaly. Some patients have this, and you may run across an occasional patient who suffers from a cervical rib or a compression syndrome as a result of it. I think this one is probably rare as rocking horse manure also. Here's an MRI showing us neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. It's image C which shows it the best. In image C, the thick fibrous band, whether it's tendon or whether it's nerve is unclear from these images, is causing compression and symptoms of a thoracic outlet syndrome. Here's another entity which is also exceedingly rare, and I'll just read what it is idiopathic hypertrophic brachial neuritis. Disease is uncommon and affects the brachial plexus gradually. History goes on for months to years. There's slow progressive weakness and wasting of the segments innervated by the nerves that are affected. Motor disability is overwhelming and the sensory findings when present are very mild. Unlike the acute form, the condition is painless from the beginning. Here's an image of idiopathic hypertrophic brachial neuritis. You can see in this MRI, comparing the left side to the right side, that the right side shows significant hypertrophy of the segments of the brachial plexus. It also appears that there is some hypertrophy of the segments on the patient's left side also. But in this T2 weighted average, only the ones on the right side are lit up indicating that that's where the pathology is. We briefly mentioned it earlier, but there is diabetic-related brachial plexopathy. Most notable, this usually involves the lumbosacral plexus and not the brachial plexus. Interestingly, the upper extremity involvement occurs in about a third of patients, and it can be a mononeuropathy affecting only one nerve, usually the ulnar or the median nerve, or even more proximal in the brachial plexus.
Most of these occur in the presence of lumbosacral plexus symptoms. The diagnosis is linked to the brachial plexus, but it usually involves the lumbosacral plexus. Let's talk about some iatrogenic plexopathies, which are exceedingly rare, given that these account for 7 to 10 percent of all brachial plexopathies, and brachial plexopathies in and of themselves are exceedingly rare. An example is a postoperative paresis, usually as a result of severe abduction of the upper extremities during an operation while the patient is lying supine on the operating room table. These usually affect the upper brachial plexus. They're secondary to traction and pressure during surgery. Patients who've had heart surgery can also be affected by the post-median sternotomy plexopathy. This is a result of the median sternotomy incision. Patient has hand weakness with paresthesias, pain of the fourth and fifth digits, and it usually results from a tr- as a result of a traction injury to the C8 anterior primary ramus. The Medial brachial fascial compartment syndrome. I've never seen this. It extends from the clavicle to the elbow. It's from puncture of the axillary or the brachial artery during arteriography or an axillary regional block, and it creates a hematoma. The median and ulnar nerves are most affected. If it is diagnosed, it requires an urgent surgical decompression as does any other compartment syndrome. In order to be complete, we must mention the environmental etiologies of a brachial plexopathy. Toxins within our environment, chemicals within our environment, oven cleaners, WD-40, Lysol, anything that can affect our nerves and or cause a neuropathy. Drugs given intentionally can cause these. General anesthesia can result in brachial plexopathies as a result of positioning on the operating room table, inflammatory conditions, which we've mentioned, and of course, strange autoimmune diseases, which in and of themselves are rare, and just about any other disease which causes inflammation to our body can result in some involvement and inflammation of the brachial plexus. Next, we'll discuss some of the plexopathies of the lumbosacral plexus. At this point, we've talked about plexopathies of the cervical plexus and the brachial plexus. We'll move on and finish this in our next presentation.